I was I always been very involved in the community. I was part of my community board, and also, like I said, I have found several organization. And um, Manhattan Borough oh, President oh, of oh, the Messenger oh, appointed me nice. to the board of the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And I was on the board, and I became an independent television producer. I have my own television program, Rando, from Senaida Mendes, for several years. And I, you know, I got involved in grassroots media. Then I was out of the city for seven years. I lived in San Francisco, California, then I lived in Washington, D.C. And I got a call from someone on the board of the and said, you know, we would love for you to come back to New York. We'd like to interview you for this position that we have a uh, director of external affairs. It's a very political position where we have the hearing at the city council and we were involved with the elected official. And I really, I wasn't really thinking of coming back to New York, but it happened. I came back and for 10 years, almost nine years, I held that position. And then a year ago, I was offered the position of director of the new site of this island. Uh, and back in Fine House Community Media Center, which I'm very happy. And we house the Youth Media Center uh, in Baku. And we work with young people, empowering them. We, we hope that we are creating the next uh, thinkers, uh, political thinkers for the 21st century, 21st century. So I'm very happy that I'm there. So that's how it's networking. You know, you have to be active, you know, you become president of your class, you become president of your, of your college. It's very important because, especially if you're going to college, the activity fee that you pay is for your activity. Do you want to bring? Like, I, I have spoken to all, all the students here. Because one of my daughter went to Albany, Sydney, Albany. One went to Iona, the other one went to Austria. And they had invited me to speak in all the school, and I recommend all the speakers. And the activity fee that they pay is to provide for the, you know, to pay for the transportation, for the lodging, the, the speaker. So it's good to know how the student government in your school works, especially when you go to college, when you pay a lot of money. You go to college, so you should know how that money is distributed and the power that you have. I have a completely different understanding of what it should be, but it's it's been great. That's definitely how we definitely want people to work. I feel like also like it's uh, it's kind of opened up a conversation within our like global community. So even like on Twitter, I feel like I interact with these really like high up female DJs now, and I feel like we have this like community channel. So it's like. 
uh, and I know that I can sort of call upon them for their help if need be. So it's like, just by like speaking up for other women, it's like you just have this huge sense of community and it's like, yeah, I wanna help you, we're doing this thing together. Uh, so I think like the more pressed we get, the more pressed they get, the more it's like we're all building each other up and supporting each other. And I really see it in like a, a tactile way. Uh, I agree with that. I feel like whenever we have gigs and there are other female DJs present, I feel like we almost instantly connect most of the time just because our experiences have been so similar, if not the same. We, we could be the same person. <laughs> um, and um, not only that, just um, from an industry perspective, I think that we also have a lot of um, women come up to the booth while we're playing and they talk about how they wanted to become DJs or they, they um, want to be DJs. And I tell them all the time, like start today, like start yesterday if you can. Just because there are a lot of, um, I think in our story specifically, we just went hard until um, like we were feeling like we were in a position to be in front of crowds. Like, there's, no, there's nothing stopping you from practicing and being being the DJ that you look up to, you know? A lot of people think that it's too late at age 29, at age 15, they think it's too late. But I feel like I, I try to encourage people on a consistent basis whenever they come up to us and tell them that there's no reason, like we, you couldn't be in the same position. What do you guys want to have great answers? Just to wrap it up, um, the last question is, what advice do you have for any girl sitting in the audience today with an interest in DJing or like in the music industry in general? Um, don't be afraid, just do it. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. I feel like I had a lot of fear with, um, like especially with music production, because that's something I really wanted to know about. Um, and I didn't really have any background in it. And the more I would sort of meet up with people and like talk about, you know, using drum machines and using synthesizers, I realized that nobody knows anything. Like you don't walk into it knowing how to use a drum machine. It's not intuitive. So just like that confidence to ask questions and that confidence to ask YouTube questions and like ask your computer questions. It's just like and admitting that you don't know anything and just that that's where you're starting and that's fine. Um, so I think just like having confidence in, in doing it and not knowing and it's okay if you're bad at it, you'll get there. Just like if you want to do it, you should just totally do it. <laughs> you can, you can. I was just going to say like, you know, me and Christine are not DJs as such. Well, Christine is actually, but, um, <laughs> but we do a lot more like behind the scenes stuff. Um, uh, I'm a booking agent, so I represent Emma. Um, so there are other fields of work that also can affect change. Um, it's not just being a DJ and a producer. There are so many other like layers to it. So if you're interested in other types of work too, there's definitely ways to do that as well. And you can talk to us after as well. Um, I would just echo the same thing, just surround yourself with people who you want to be like. Um, there are people I look up to, I would just connect with them, like if I follow the DJ I love their set, I would just be like, I love your set, are you down to give us a lesson? And you'd be surprised how many people say yes, like if you just ask like, for the help. So don't be afraid to ask for help, and if you're doing something today and you just feel like you want to try something else, try something else tomorrow. Yeah. And just start, like it's just, it's that easy. Um, I would just say also don't, I mean, don't be afraid of failing. I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of times, especially, um, like, as a woman, a lot of people will try to make you think that um, DJing something that you can't do, I think it's actually been one of the things that, that's made me feel kind of stronger, because once you push past um, that threshold of having people make you feel like you like can't be in a certain space, that's that's really one of the, those bigger monuments kind of in the process for me. I think once you get past that, you recognize that, okay, I'm DJing, like I can, pro I can produce today, like I can, like this, this is a space for me. So I would just say,
kind of don't let fear hold you back. Yeah, I was gonna just <laughs> open up <laughs> for questions. <laughs> How does your choice of artists like reflect like your beliefs, or you know, do you get to in impact that at all? That's an interesting question. Should I re-say it with the microphone? Well, um, we DJ a really wide array of parties. Um, so one day it could be hip hop and another night it, it could be deep house and another it could be like reggae. I think um, I fuel, we, we generally, I can't speak for every DJ, but we, we like to fuel our sets based on who's, who's there. Um, my general preferen preference is if the song offends me, I won't play it. But. I, I, I'm acting based on my personal preference, I guess, and, and my threshold for offensive versus not offensive. Um, even, and I, I learn to trust my gut. If I don't like a song, no matter how popular it is, I will not play that song. Sometimes I don't even download that song. Um, but that just goes towards, I guess, our taste. Okay, so well, we listen. We listen to a lot of music without lyrics, so um, <laughs> um, that's kind of an interesting question. We haven't thrown that many events with music. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I guess it's tricky. Sometimes I feel that um, it's a it's a difficult call to like. Uh, it's like, do you want to take it lightly as hyperbole? Like maybe. Maybe it's sort of like uh, more theatrical, and like like that's how I think of a lot of like I love like so much rap music that like if you really listen to it, it's like hmm, not so sure about that. But it's like I think a lot of it is I, at least I tell myself like I think it's hyperbole. It's like sort of like an expansion of of reality, um, and that is kind of like how I think about it. Uh, so it's like I'm just enjoying this, and I'm not gonna like pick it apart. But I think that, yeah, if, if you feel offended by it and it's challenging you, then you don't need to have that in your life at all. Um, so it's just really like, I think, yeah, how you feel about it personally. If you feel like it's perpetuating violence, then like, you know, you can avoid that. Um, but it's just up to your interpretation, I think, too. Um, and if, if you can find something to enjoy in it or if you feel offended by it, it's your choice. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a big conversation, though, because a lot, a lot of, a lot of music has these like dichotomies, so it's a it's a tricky thing for sure. Yeah. Um, so, okay, you're a DJ. So like, if you if they gave you like some like a list of songs, right, and it has something like and you were listening to them and you're like, whoa, what 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 did they say? Did they say something about like a woman and like saying some that the writers are things about them, like. The point is like, would you play it, play it just because you're like getting a paycheck? Like sometimes you're like, oh, it's just the money, like I need the money or something like that. So it's like, I'm gonna still play it just for like the money or you're like, oh no. Because you're getting paid for it and it's like something important, so money. <laughs> no, I get, I get the question you're asking and I won't take a paycheck if I, if I don't feel a sense of control or autonomy over what I'm playing. Because, I mean, why did you hire a DJ if you had a specific list of songs that you just needed to get out into the world? Right, if you're hiring me, I think that you're also hiring me for the trust and like the care that I'm putting into what I'm playing and for my, my judgment and for the vibe that I'm creating for everybody who's in attendance. And so if someone's like, you know what, do or die, play this song, it's offensive, I'm offended by it, like I'm, I'm not gonna necessarily play it. Also, <coughs> we ignore requests all the time if, it's, <laughs> if it doesn't fit into what's happening. I think like derogatory or not, if someone comes up to the booth and asks for a specific song, it's 
when when you were the person in control of the party and you're curating the music for a party, if you feel that the one request or one request is going to throw off the entire vibe of the party, that's a request that shouldn't be taken. If you feel like maybe maybe it's a, a valid request and it could fit into the vibe that you're creating, you can maybe take it, but that's your choice and I never feel pressured to take any of those suggestions if I if I feel like it kind of messes with the integrity of our set or my ge general moral integrity. Yeah, I would just say that like there's something else that you can do. Like there's going to be another job that is going to fit you and make you feel good about yourself and uh, sometimes it's hard to see that I think and you think like oh I should just take this opportunity because they're gonna pay me and like I get to do my thing, but it's like they're actually controlling it so much that it's not fun for you and it's not valuing your worth. So it's like I think sometimes you just have to be a little more expansive in your thinking and remember like, okay, there's something out there for me. I'm gonna say no to this even though it's really hard because I want that money, but something that's actually the right fit that makes you feel good is gonna be there. I mean, we say no to events a lot because of the way that the, term, the way that the person comes at us with the idea or what they have in mind, and if they have a certain, they're way too controlling with how they talk. It's just not going to happen because um, that's not really what we're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, we want women who play to feel comfortable and not to feel like they have to play a song they don't want to play. It's just so inappropriate, I think. That's it. So if I asked you to like DJ my birthday party, would it be <laughs> No, I'm just like, saying, yeah, yeah, would it be cool if I like gave you a list of songs that I like have to hear? No, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with um, private events are a little bit different. Like if you're doing a private event, you realize that there's there's someone who has a specific vision for their event and like want to hear songs. Like if for some reason we're DJ or wedding, I'm not gonna tell the bride she can't hear like her favorite one, her favorite three songs. Like I'm not gonna tell her that. But if for some reason her favorite song is like my least favorite song, maybe I'll play the three that I liked and the one that I didn't. Cause, because at the end of the day, I feel like say if I'm at a club and um, someone controls the set too much, and I'm playing and it's not really us, I feel like at the end of the day, nobody in the crowd knows that they gave you that list. It's still kind of your brand that you have to protect at the end of the day. So regardless of what instructions you're given, you have to try to keep it true to what you're doing so you're not giving off to other people something that's kind of ingenuine or inauthentic. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Thank you. How y'all doing? Um, I just need some advice. I'm a rapper, and I just um need some advice on. <laughs> no, but um, I just need some advice on how to get like people to listen to my music instead of like looking at it as a sex symbol. Because as you can see, I don't dress like Nicki Minaj or Lil' Kim. So I would want people to listen to my music versus how I dress. So do y'all have any advice on that? I mean, if you're on any music platforms, I would say that's a great um, way to get your music out there, social media. But beyond that, reach out to, to different artists who you want to collaborate with. You'd be surprised who would answer, you know? Even if it's like sending a message on SoundCloud or on Twitter, on, on any or you can or even working with DJs, being like, can you play my stuff in your set? Like, I just think you can think about it in different ways. I've thought about this a lot, and I, I feel kind of driven by it, where I'm like, okay, so no matter how I want to present myself, I'm just going to be undeniable. So it's like, it makes me like want to just be really good, uh, because I do feel like there is a lot of pressure to present as like a femme woman, and a lot of female DJs even do, and that's like totally fine because that's what they're comfortable with, but I wasn't comfortable with that, and I'm still not really comfortable with that. So I feel like it kind of does drive me to like 
just say like, this is about me performing and me performing really well. So uh, it's like, I, I think as soon as that conversation starts to come about, you can just say like, well, actually it's about my music and what I'm playing. It's not about what I look like, it's not about the clothes I'm wearing. Um, and you should just be able to present however you want and be respected for what you do. Um, I feel really strongly about that, and I think that that's how I think about it mentally. Like that's how I kind of get through those moments. Is I'm just like, this is about me doing as well as I can, uh, and just like you find it, you find support doing that if you just keep going for it. Oh my god! <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> but it's like, because <laughs> um, then you find a community that that supports you for who you are. You know, so it's like then it doesn't even matter anymore. So I don't even think about it now. And I, I can present however I want because I have people that support me um, doing it that way. I also, um, I think about Missy Elliott a lot <laughs> um, because I feel like she is so like not bound to any particular look um, and has presented as them, presented as butch, like, and just is so undeniably good that no one is gonna mess with that. You know, and that's like, so I feel like I just kind of look for those role models too, where it's like, even if I have five people that I can think about that inspire me and inspire that way of thinking, then that gets me through it. Um, yeah. Just be you. Like, don't change, just be you. Because whatever you're saying, whatever you're feeling, that confidence will resonate with someone. And that beyond anything, it doesn't matter. And people will feel it. And that's a feeling. It's not, you know what I mean? And that visibility is so important because there are people like you, there is a community around. Like, I totally understand what you're saying. So, yeah, let's keep doing it. Okay, we're going to have one last question. Did you, did you have a question? One last question. And. I, so. Um, in general, how do you feel about like, because not artists, in general, women in the music industry um, are always expected to give a certain look or to be portrayed a certain way. And most of the time they sexualize it. So how do you feel about that? How does it affect you? Um, I think it's people already like kind of give weird comments about us being twins, and I'm like, we're, we're sisters. Like we're we're twins. That's like, that, I feel like people try to kind of um, sexualize that already. But I think a lot of the time you don't realize how in control you are of your image. Sometimes people book us because they want to put a picture on a flyer of two of twin girls. And sometimes, a lot, a lot of the time, actually, we send back our logo and we tell them to use that instead because I'm not trying to sell what we look like. I'm trying to sell like our brand and our brand of music as DJs. And I think a lot of times people will try to force that onto you. Um, and I think regardless of how I dress, I don't necessarily, um, a lot of times when we're accepting gigs, I don't want to sell my look. I'm trying to sell us as DJs. So I think, um, like, once you recognize what your actual, like, what your service is, and kind of what value you're trying to provide, you figure out how you can make people accept that as it is. You can't necessarily stop stop the way people think about you, but you are in control of what images people have of you, how they're branding you, if you're in those conversations. So you just be surprised how much control you can have in that way. That's all I would say. Um, just like, <laughs> uh, don't believe that that's necessary ever. I've had so many men try and convince me that if I sexualized my image, I'd be more successful. And it's not true. You don't have to do that. You don't ever have to do it. Never do it. <laughs> like, I think that so many people in the industry just think that this one idea works, and it's not true. Um, so don't let anyone convince you of that, because they're going to try. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you don't want to have a sexualized image, you don't have to. You can just be who you are and 
Crush what you're doing and it's gonna be fun. <laughs>